So we'll get started in a few minutes. I don't know. I think we might be waiting for one or two more. Sure. I am on, but my video for whatever reason is not working. Let's see. Hi, Juliana. Hey, Jeff. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm gonna I'm gonna go off camera now before the barking starts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so whenever you're ready, Mike, we can get started. You know, if we everybody recorded. could mute themselves, it would help just so you're not hopping on. And then I'll open it up for some questions at the end. So. Well, again, I just want to say thank you for taking the time uh, to present to a lot of our clients and people that have questions on the college planning uh, endeavor that they may have or will be starting soon um, as we move forward. And a lot of things have changed in the college planning world. So definitely appreciate your time, Mike, and uh, we'll kick it over to you to get started. Sure. Thanks, Al. I appreciate uh, the invite to present. It's, uh, it, it is appreciated. Uh, my, again, my name is Mike Broderick. I'm the owner of Advantage College Planning of Buffalo. Uh, so what we do is we help families navigate all aspects of the college admissions process. Uh, as early as eighth grade, we work with students uh, to help them plan their coursework through high school. Uh, we help them set and achieve goals, and select activities that help push them beyond their comfort zones. Uh, we also help families and students uh, find careers and majors that are a good fit based on that student's aptitude and personality. Uh, we help them create a balanced list so that students have a variety of options when it's time to make a decision. Uh, and really at the end, when they click send on their application, we want them to be confident that they're putting their best foot forward. So here's today's agenda. Uh, we're gonna go over college affordability and the cost of college. Uh, then we'll talk about a successful college search and what that means. We'll go over a timeline for junior and senior year for applications. And we'll finish with the most important factors the colleges consider in the application process. Really, this is, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be breaking this down and kind of taking a 10,000 foot view of a process that sometimes can, uh, I have students as early as eighth grade and I have students that are, are going into their senior year when they start with this. Uh, so there, there's a lot that goes into this, but I figured for this presentation, we'll take a 10,000 foot view. So there are two different types of financial aid. Uh, there's both merit and need-based aid. Now I'm not a financial advisor, uh, so I don't uh, pretend to be, but I do help families navigate uh, how to find merit-based aid. And I can walk a family through a FAFSA. So merit-based aid is basically based on achievement, whether it be academic, uh, athletic, artistic, whatever the college deems is worthy of a scholarship. Uh, most of the time, this is based on academics and the amount widely varies by college. Uh, and some are, are, are much more philanthropic and generous than others. The Ivy Leagues, for example, do not give merit-based aid. They put all of their resources into need-based. 
other less selective schools, private colleges offer lots of merit aid. Uh, schools, uh, perhaps, you know, Hobart William Smith is an example. Uh, Niagara, St. Bonaventure get pretty creative uh, with their merit-based aid. Uh, they're good local examples. Sticker price in this process is usually irrelevant to the net cost. Uh, you have to do research to find out who's generous with those merit-based scholarships. Let's talk for a second about need-based aid. Need-based aid will be based on your expected family contribution or the EFC. Uh, the government and colleges calculate the EFC uh, from the FAFSA, the FAFSA form that all families fill out. Uh, that will determine the estimated family contribution. Let's run real quick up on, up on the screen. You have your cost of attendance for the college minus the estimated family contribution will equal the need. Uh, and that is the formula that schools use when they begin uh, to offer their need-based financial aid. So let's run through a quick example. Let's say a family's estimated family contribution runs $25,000 a year. Let's just, that's a good number. The cost of attendance at say Syracuse, or let's use University of Buffalo. At the University of Buffalo, the cost of attendance is roughly $25,000 a year. At the University of Buffalo, the family with the EFC of 25,000 wouldn't qualify for need-based aid. So let's do Syracuse. The cost of attendance is around 75,000 per year. That same family would qualify for 50,000 a year in need-based aid. The bottom line is don't assume you won't qualify for need-based financial aid until you learn what your estimated family contribution is. Now, all schools, when you do go into the financial aid section, they should have a need-based calculator where you can go in and kind of get, put in some information. The schools don't look at it. But in the end, it'll give you a nice ballpark of what your EFC or what you could expect your EFC to be. Uh, I do recommend going in and using those. Uh, they are pretty accurate uh, and it is a good tool so that you do get a ballpark as to what you're looking at per institution. All right, let's move on. Ah, okay. The need-based calculator. This tool helps families understand merit and need-based financial aid at each, at each institution. So the College Navigator, if you Google College Navigator, it will come up. Uh, it is a government site. Uh, it is very accurate. If you can see this school that we pulled up is Meredith College. It was just a random school that we brought up when we put this together uh, in North Carolina. It does give some basic information, general information. Uh, if you can see, then there is, uh, there, are, there are different tabs, general information, tuition and fees and estimated student expenses, uh, and then financial aid. And it does break it down into pretty good detail. Uh, whether this school offers merit-based aid, uh, whether, you know, of course it offers need-based aid, but what those numbers could look like based on your individual family. So I do recommend having College Navigator on your browser uh, and refer to it routinely because it's important to have those conversations and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. The college search. All right, the college search process can start early in high school. I recommend it starting early in high school. Your student can begin self-reflection as early as eighth grade, uh, ninth grade. Think about what classes they enjoy and why it is that they enjoy them. 
because what we do an advantage is we kind of break the college search down in colleges uh, into various areas of fit. And we look for best fit. We don't look for marquee name. We don't look for highest rank. We look for best fit via the student. One of the ways we do this is we first look at academics. Uh, and basically when we look at fit, we look at it like it's a pie. And there are four slices to the pie. One of the slices is academics, right? That's why the student is number one choosing that school or choosing to look at that school, all right? Academic fit, majors, programs such as internships, co-ops. Do they offer study abroad, abroad programs? Average class sizes, right? I've had students that have gone over to UB and looked at UB and then they went down because they didn't want to stay local. They went and looked at Ohio State and then they came back and they said, you know, Mr. Broderick, it's overwhelming. I don't want those larger classrooms. That's a good thing to know because you can begin to readjust, right? We can send a student off to a medium-sized school to take a look or a smaller liberal arts college to take a look and hopefully find and add that to the formula of fit for that student. So the average class sizes. Academic climate, is the school ultra competitive? Is it collaborative? Is it known to be collaborative? Uh, is it intense? Or is it a well-balanced academic climate on the campus? Now, the University of Buffalo is a great example, pretty well-balanced. Most big research universities, uh, research universities so your Penn State, your, 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 your Tennessee, your Georgia, uh, these are big state research universities. They're very deep, they're very broad, uh, and they're very well balanced. A student that goes and visits a, uh, a, a school like Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh is going to find a much different atmosphere uh, than they would find at one of those bigger institutions. Uh, Carnegie Mellon is really one of the best uh, engineering schools in the country, if not the world. And it is known for being a bit of a pressure cooker. It is intense, it is competitive, right? You're not gonna, on a Friday night, you're not going to, uh, you're gonna see a very, you know, a very different campus uh, than you would say uh, at UB or, or you know, Binghamton, uh, you know, maybe, even Syracuse, uh, you know, you're just, those students, they're there to work. And there are plenty of schools out there like that, you know, RPI to a lesser extent, right? Your Ivies uh, are competitive environments. Uh, your NESCAC schools like your Bowdoin or your Williams or Amherst, your Tufts, uh, these are competitive schools, all right? So having them go and visit and see what those schools are like, there's value there because they can kind of determine whether they're comfortable or not. Now to assess the fit, you use the college website to look for particular majors. You try to sit in a class, right? How can, uh, you know, you, you go to third party sites like niche.com uh, or uh, there are different, sites out there that review schools uh, and tell you a lot of things that perhaps they won't learn by going to the admissions site. Um, you know, there are, there really are some fantastic uh, sites out there. Uh, niche comes to mind. Uh, there's another one that I can't think of off the top of my head. Princeton Review does a, 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 is a nice site. World, uh, US News and World Report, I don't care for the rankings. Uh, but the information and the writing is normally really, really good uh, when it comes to their reviews of schools. Again, ranks, rankings are something we have to deal with. Uh, I, I don't particularly care for them, uh, but they do impact and they will impact your students' experience. 
Mike, I don't know if you want to take questions during the middle. Are you saying Mitch, M-I-T-C-H? I'm not familiar with that. M-I-T-C-H-E. And, and like Nancy? Yes. Okay, thanks. Or N-I-C-H-E, sorry, N-I-C-H-E, Mitch Dodge. Okay. Got it. Thanks. If you Google, it'll pop up real quick. It's a uh, it's an outstanding third party site. So after academics, you know, you get into the social fit. What do students want to do when they're not in the classroom uh, and involved in the academic piece? A lot of maturity and life experience happens during those four years. Which campus environment will be a good fit for them when they're eighteen and continue? to fill those needs uh, through graduation? Do they offer student uh, the opportunity to find a job on campus? Uh, are there ways to connect to the community if that's important to them? Uh, does the student have outdoor interests? Do they like to camp? Do they like to hike? Are they involved in, are they interested in Greek life uh, in that type of social life? Do they have particular interest in certain types of clubs? I've had students that have been interested in a gaming club uh, because that's, that's big on campus right now. Uh, and it's very, very popular. Uh, and students want to be able to do that. Uh, are they interested politically? Do they want, look, do they, are they interested in certain types of political clubs? Uh, those are our, all important. Make a list before you go and visit the schools that you're interested in visiting and researching and start checking off boxes. Basic, and you can really get a lot right off of their website. So do they have, you can jump right into admissions, right? They should have a tab that has student life, right? There should be a tab that is athletics. If those are all important pieces of the social life of your student or the potential social life of your student. After social is, is financial fit and college costs. It's important to figure out your fit early, to have those uncomfortable conversations, even with the student, so that you can put the family formula together and understand who's paying for all of this. What is the budget? Is the family going 50-50 with the student, right? Is the college expense pretty much on the student? Is it 80-20, right? I've seen families do it all sorts of different ways. It's just important to do it. No one wants to, it's not a fun conversation to have because you're laying out all your cards out on the table, uh, but nothing is worse than having a family say, you just worry about getting into school, we'll take care of the rest of it. Because that bill comes and there's nothing worse than the student really working hard, sacrificing, doing everything they need to do to get into that dream school and have that parent say, you know what, it's just not in the cards. We've got to figure out a plan B, all right? Know that early, revisit it throughout their high school career. Okay, so if they do get, when they do get into that number one school, it's all, it's all planned for. They've got it figured out. They've got the formula, right? Uh, there, there's merit-based. Again, there's need-based. There are lots of private scholarships available for those students that are really go-getters. Uh, one of the things I offer all of my students is a book called The Confessions of a Scholarship Winner. The student uh, who wrote it, a young lady by the name of Christina Ellis, she is excellent because I want my students to be aggressive uh, in looking for local and regional scholarships. The big national scholarships are difficult to, to get, uh, but I never, you know, I, I never tell them not to apply. Uh, and then, you know, so there's the need-based there's the merit-based, and then there's private scholarships. And then there are student loans. Uh, and it's the cheapest money they're ever going to borrow. 
there is a return on investment. And as long as you keep that spending under control, uh, there, there, it's not something to shy away from necessarily. Uh, th there is smart money out there to borrow. Uh, so if you can, if you can work out a, a, a formula that works for your family, uh, it can be pretty painless when it's time to send your student off and, and take care of that first bill. So financial fit is incredibly important. So this is just New York State. I threw some schools up here. We have lots of variety here in Western New York. Uh, some schools give more uh, aid than less. Uh, there's, as far as academic fit, there's a lot of variety when it comes to social fit. There's lots of variety when it comes to financial fit. Uh, there's lots of variety. The last piece of fit, and we don't necessarily touch on it in this, but I'm going to, is geographic. Um, I've had students walk in and say, Mr. Brodick, I don't want snow. I've had plenty. I want, a, I want sun. Uh, I want more moderate temperatures. What can we do? Uh, it's just another piece of the pie. All right. All of a sudden we're starting to look, you know, I'd say south. Uh, we start looking southwest. Uh, if they're really looking for sun and they really don't want cold temperatures, and then I've had students walk in and say, Mr. Broderick, I love to ski. I'd ski around if I could. Uh, last year, I sent a student uh, to University of Montana. Loves it. Couldn't possibly be happier. Uh, skis pretty much year round. Uh, and is kind of has that Western vibe that is growing in popularity. It was a perfect fit for this student. Uh, so it is. Uh, geographic is one last piece of the pie. But we do have a lot of variety and it's, it'll lead us into what we're gonna talk about next. Other search considerations. All right, what is that special sauce uh, that a student's looking for uh, when it comes to their experience? Do they want research opportunities? Do they want internship uh, or co-op opportunities? Right? Do they want football Saturdays? Right? Do they want? I bet I sent a student a couple of years back to Alabama because he wanted this. He wanted to go and camp out overnight for tickets and have that you know big time game experience. Uh, in the SEC, they don't do it any better. So he went down there, loved it, had a great four years, uh, came back north for graduate school, and, and he's off and running. Uh, but what is that? other consideration that your student is looking for. Do they want access to a big city? Do they want an urban environment, right? Or will a small, small town do, right? Going to Colgate uh, is a much different experience than going to Fordham, right? Both are great academic institutions, but geographically, they're a lot different, right? So trying to put lists together as to what students want, what they want out of this experience, uh, so that when you start building your list, you can refer to it often. Okay, so I threw a lot at you there. We do throw a lot at you during this presentation, um, and I'll be taking some questions at the end. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about our college application timeline. This is more specifically for juniors and seniors. Uh, eight, for ninth and 10th graders, the most you can do is have them begin to reflect on their areas of interests, where are their strengths, what do they, uh, you know, what, start kicking around ideas as to what majors may appeal to them, uh, getting them on campuses as early as possible uh, so that they can start getting a feel for the differences, right? Walking UB is a lot different than walking Niagara. Uh, but getting them on those campuses, you don't have to do a formal visit, right? You don't have to call admissions. You can just get on campus, drive through, look for targets of opportunity, right? If you're driving south for vacation, right? I've had families go to Hilton Head and I tell them, drive through Clemson, stop at Clemson, go to the College of Charleston, take a look at it, right? Take notes. What does a student like? What, what appeals to them? What doesn't? 
So those are really the best things you can do freshman and sophomore year. You get into that junior year. And you should be really getting into your college visits and research. In February, the junior year, you're looking to take the ACT in March, the SAT. I, I always encourage my students to take both tests, right? Currently we're in a test optional environment. I don't know how long that's going to stick around. You're seeing the schools drop off of it. MIT was the first, they want the math score. Uh, Purdue for some of its programs dropped off. Georgia dropped off for some of its programs. Uh, so yes, the colleges or university will say we're test optional, but for certain programs, they ask for it. So to be safe, have it in your back pocket, have the student uh, prepare for it and take it and take both. And I am gonna encourage this, take both. They're different tests. Right, and a student may do better on the ACT than the SAT and vice versa. Colleges do not care which scores you send in. They couldn't care less. If they look for standardized tests, they're just asking for, for a score to be sent in. Uh, I've had students take an ACT on a Saturday morning, uh, a couple of months after taking an SAT, and they did quite a bit better. Uh, on the ACT. And that's where student families put their money behind it when it came to preparation for, for the test. Uh, and that's the one they used for their college application process. So January, February, March of that junior year, you're looking, and even into April, you're getting into college visits. In May of that junior year, uh, that late spring, you should be finalizing that list and really beginning those college applications. At least the common, that common application you, you'd like to have done as much as possible going into that early, uh, early in summer so that you can focus on essays because that's pretty much the most time consuming. Uh, the common application or uh, if the school has an independent application like Georgetown, has their own application, they don't take the common application. Uh, you have opportunity then to uh, dive in and work on essays uh, and perfect those. The senior year, again, you're looking at that summer going in, essay and application workshops. I would say in August, the first week of September, those applications should be complete. You wanna make sure you have your recommendations handy to add to them. Uh, you wanna make sure that the essays are done because that student also come fall is jumping into their senior year. It's gonna be really busy, right? In theory, it should be their most difficult academic semester uh, going into that senior year. Uh, they're going to be busy. They're going to be involved in clubs. They're going to be involved in sports. They're going to be taking difficult courses. The more you can get done regarding this process through that senior year summer, the better off you'll be and the better experience it'll be for your student. You get into October, you get into your early action deadlines. Uh, in November, more early action, more early decision uh, deadlines. The difference between early action and early decision, early action is non-binding, all right? Early decision in theory is binding. Uh, it's very difficult for a student to apply early decision and then back out of that decision uh, once it's been offered uh, because there's statistical advantage. Uh, there is a statistical advantage to applying early decision to a top school. Uh, early action, there is some statistical advantage, but it's not huge. Uh, the advantage to the schools is they begin to compile numbers early, right? They begin filling beds early so that in December and in January, when those regular admission deadlines occur, 
uh, and they really get into the heat of their application season, uh, they've already started to fill some bets. So that it is valuable to them. Um, early decision, you're starting to see some schools with an early decision two. Some even then have an early decision three. Uh, it has become kind of the wild west, how colleges are, are handling this application process. There's very little standardization. Uh, so make sure as you begin to put your list together, you are visiting that college website regularly and come up with a system uh, of tracking deadlines. Uh, and what do they want regarding their pieces of their application? So summer, uh, essay and applications, completing applications, early action deadlines in October and November, along with early decision uh, deadlines. December, you're kind of doing last minute prep for those January regular, uh, regular application deadlines. Most students, I would say 80 to 85% of students still today apply regular decision. All right, so I know early action, early decision, a lot of people talk about it, but most students apply regular decision. All right, important factors regarding the application process. Rigor of, cur of curriculum, nothing trumps the rigor of curriculum when it comes to what admissions looks for in rendering a decision. Uh, taking the most difficult and most challenging courses uh, that a school offers is appealing to an admissions office. There's no way around it. Grades in those courses, uh, making sure that you're scoring well, taking AP courses or honors level courses and scoring Cs uh, in, in, in 80s uh, isn't necessarily what admissions wants. There's a way to create a balance, right? Finding areas of interest that your student or areas of strength uh, in your student's academic performance, those are the areas that you should be having them try an AP course, having them try an honors course so that they can score well. Uh, and then filling out their coursework uh, with other courses. All right. So rigor of the curriculum, grades. Standardized test scores has dropped a little bit in importance. Uh, I think the essays have taken, and I probably should switch this over. I apologize for that. Essays have become more important uh, in today's day and age uh, than standardized test scores, but schools are still asking for them. Uh, so it is important to have them handy. Extracurricular activities. Admissions offices are looking for depth, not breadth. Years ago, they used to look for well-rounded students and students like myself would run in their junior year and check a whole lot of boxes, right? They'd sign up for a whole lot of clubs that they really didn't have interest in just so they could put it on their college application. Colleges know that they're no longer interested in that. What they want is a couple of areas of interest where the student has been involved for a length of time and can speak about it passionately, right? If you have a student that is involved in Boy Scouts, the longer they stay in it, the more valuable it is, right? I've had, I had a senior two years ago that wanted to drop as a senior. They're going for Eagle Scout after lots of conversations and lots of encouragement, we encourage them to finish up, finish what they started. Uh, there's value in that and the student now is at Notre Dame. So it's, again, it, it is depth of interest uh, in those extracurricular activities, not necessarily breadth. Character is very important. Um, I'd love to say that the college admission system has some uniformity and they look at this in the same fashion from school to school. They do not. Uh, there are some schools out there that don't want letters of recommendation anymore. Uh, I, I don't 
you have to know that, right? You have to keep track of that when it comes to the student's admission uh, and application to that school. But to check, you know, to, to get an idea as to character, they're going to be asking for letters of recommendation, and then they're going to be looking at the essays. It's a good way for them to determine through their extracurricular, through their letters of recommendation, and through their essays, what type of student will I be bringing onto campus? Because that's my job as the admissions officer, is to be bringing students, good quality students onto my campus and into our community. That's my job, that's my charge. So essays. Essays have grown in importance. Uh, it's important to make sure that the essays are in the student's voice. Don't put it through the wash too many times. Oftentimes, you know, the more a, an adult looks at it and a student, the more little tweaks they make, the drier the essay appears when it, uh, when it finally gets to an admissions office. Have them take chances, have them take risks, be as creative as possible when it comes to the essays, right? Looking at certain activities or certain life experiences uh, in a unique way uh, is important. I had a college admissions guy, a uh, college admissions officer from Middlebury tell me, Mike, if I have to read one more essay, about a, the way a student overcame adversity uh, was by working their way through a knee injury their sophomore year playing lacrosse. He goes, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gonna quit my job. He goes, I, I read thousands of those. Be creative, take chances. And then there are special factors. Special factors could be, do they wanna be involved in dance on campus? Do they want to be involved in band? Are they going to be involved artistically? Are they going to write for the paper or try to write for the paper? Right? Are they interested in playing a sport? Right? If you're talking D1, Division I, this factor goes up a little bit. It becomes a little bit more important to the applicant. Uh, but, you know, what, are, what is that student going to do on campus? That falls under special factors. All right, we were hoping this was gonna last about 40 minutes. I think we're just about there. Uh, I threw a lot of information at you. We do in this webinar. Uh, again, it's about a 10,000 foot view. Here's our website. We do have some resources uh, for families. They're free of charge, uh, blog podcasts. Uh, we often interview um, college admissions officers, uh, whether they be uh, you know, from around here in Western New York. We also have an office in Raleigh, Durham. We have an office in Orlando. We have an office in uh, Portland, Maine. Now we have one in San Francisco. So we're beginning to spread uh, across the country. So we often interview college admissions folks from those regional areas. Um, here's my information. Feel free to reach out via email or give me a call. Uh, I'm always around to answer questions. Uh, really, thank you for your time. And uh, I'm going to open it up to any questions that people may have. Yeah, I have a few, but I'll wait for anyone else if they want to go first. Sure. Anyone have anything they want to ask? No, nope, I'm good for right now. Thank you. Sure. So um, back to the SATs um, scores, is there like a ballpark that certain colleges are looking for? I think the highest is what, 1,600? So are colleges looking... You know, to get yes. 1600 is really well, I mean, but are they looking that 1100 to 1400, 1200 to 1500? I mean, I guess different schools would look at different scores. Yes, that's a great question. Now, there's, you have to do your research. Uh, you have to dive in. You have to Google the school and actually Google that. What are the, what's the SAT or ACT range? 
there are third parties out there that keep track of that information. Uh, I myself have multiple platforms uh, where I can pull up uh, a school, any particular school, see what the 50 percentile is uh, of students that are accepted via ACT or SAT in any given year. Uh, and then if the student is on the low end of that 50 percentile, I may not re uh, recommend them sending in their test scores. I only recommend them sending in their test scores if we feel based on the data, it could improve their application. Okay, so if you're, if a student, you know, is, you know, 550 in math in the low end of a school uh, when it comes to the SAT math is, you know, 570, 600 uh, in math, I may hesitate. But if they, you know, they scored really well and they're at 620 or 630 and we think it can improve or, 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 or move their application forward, that's when I'd say, yeah, you know, but it would be a group decision. And in the end, it's the students and the families. I just make recommendations. But you really have got to research. There's all sorts of info on there. Again, some of those third party research sites that I mentioned, uh, you can find it there, some of it. I know in niche, you can actually go into niche.com and there's a section, if you create an account, you can put in your students' academic information, including their testing, and it'll actually plot it on a graph for you. You know, it's not 100% accurate, but it's based on a heck of a lot of data. And some families find it helpful. Now, the other thing is a merit-based scholarship. So going flip-flop to athletic, people think that, you know, the ultimate goal is to get an athletic scholarship. My son or daughter is good at track or golf or hockey or whatever that you know, the likelihood that they'll get a scholarship is is out there. And is there any data on like how many people actually receive full scholarships to actual college athletics? It's never as many as you think. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, it, it's the more I do this, uh, Alan, I, I kind of specialize in working with athletes and college athletes. The more I'm finding that it's also it depends. It's sports dependent. Right. So mm -hmm. schools at the division one level, right. Division three, you don't get, you don't get athletic scholarships. They don't offer it. Sometimes division three schools will get a little creative um, and offer up an, an alumni scholarship of $2,500 for a student that may play uh, on the, the school's division three basketball team. Right. Uh, that may happen. They'll never admit to that, but I see it happen all the time. Right. At the division one, uh, division two is not very big. Uh, to get a division two scholarship is very, very difficult just because they're so small. Uh, there aren't many out there. At the division one level, it is sport dependent. So football, of course, is king football, uh, basketball. And then you start seeing a substantial drop off. Students getting full scholarships in sports like lacrosse, hockey, uh, you know, soccer, very, very, uh, you know, full scholarships are almost unheard of. Uh, you can see, a, a, you know, a, a handful of students uh, on a division one hockey program, look at Canisius College, for example, maybe their top line has full scholarships. The rest of those guys are 50 percent, 25 percent when it comes to scholarship offers. Um, you know, even at the bigger schools, your, your Michigan, uh, your Boston University, maybe 10 kids on the roster have a full scholarship. Uh, the rest are, are, are scrambling and scratching, uh, scraping by to get pieces of all their scholarships. Um, they just they don't have the budgets that you think they do. Uh, they, they just never do. Schools also get a little creative, even if they're playing club. 
club sports are not what they were when I was going to school. Uh, and, and, and I'm guessing to the parents that are on this call, uh, club has come a long way. Sometimes there is some money. Uh, I had a student that's going to Siena to play rugby. There's a little bit of a gift for rugby uh, to play for them, although it's club, right? Club for a long time, NAIA, uh, they were not formally uh, connected to the schools that they represented. That's not the case anymore. Uh, now they fall under, more often than not, uh, they'll fall under student services. Uh, so there is a budget. Okay, but to get an athletic scholarship, they are far and few between. So the activities point was a good one. Um, my daughter was in honor society, Spanish honor society, and some different activities at school that she actually did honor society all four years. Um, but one of the local colleges in Rochester actually looked at that and actually told her how impressed they were and that the opportunities were a little bit better because of all those activities that she was doing where they weren't a division one or a division three. She's a dancer. So there's not much scholarship money out there anyways for dancers, but, sure. um, but they did make that point of the opportunity to get scholarship money because of those activities. Yes, absolutely. And again, be creative and be aggressive with local and regional private scholarships. They are out there. Uh, a student just got $2,500 from the Rotary Club, right? I have a, a student whose father's a fireman uh, in the Buffalo Fire Department, just got $5,000 a year because dad uh, is, on the, is in the fire department. Uh, you start adding that up, it, 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 it accumulates quickly and it can really help uh, the bottom line. Uh, the, the, the toughest, uh, my biggest challenge, especially with younger students, is getting them to understand that it's real money. And it, it's actual paper money that you're saving at the, at the end of the day. Uh, they, they, early on, they have a hard time grasping the concept. It takes some time. But uh, once you get there, uh, the more aggressive they are, the better off they'll be at the end. Well, it's funny, my friend's daughter is going to the University of Tennessee, and as freshmen, they get to stay on campus. After their freshman year, there's no more campus living. you got to find an apartment. And now when you're talking 60, 70,000 kids looking for a place to live in a small town, it becomes a little bit of an issue. <laughs> yes. And you have to be, that's, it's so, that's great, Al. you got to be conscious of that if there are issues in the area. The University of Tampa has a terrible problem with, uh, with, with student housing. Uh, the University of California system and the Cal State system are having really awful problems uh, guaranteeing housing for students um, past their freshman year. Uh, you know, and they're not going to, they're not really going to admit it. Uh, you've got to research it. Um, little things like bringing a car to school, right? Mm -hmm. Some schools, there's, there's no park, right? College of Charleston. Horrible. You, you, you can, sometimes you can find a local person that'll rent a spot in their driveway, right? Like it's, it really varies. Uh, and it all comes down to being, uh, to being thorough in your research. Thanks. Uh, anyone else have any other questions? All right. Well, Mike, I appreciate your time and I'll, um, we will be publishing this to YouTube and in that, uh, YouTube, I will, uh, reference obviously your website, um, and some of the resources that you mentioned in this presentation. Sure. So well, I start. appreciate it, Al. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, again, uh, to everyone on the call, thank you. And, uh, have a great day. Enjoy the sunshine in Buffalo, New York. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Al, I'll send it over to you.